Welcome into the first podcast of our T20 Cricket World Cup follow along. I'm Jerry Walker. Alongside me is Jared Prosser. And these are going to be some podcasts that we're going to be doing every couple days during the first round. And then once it gets into the Super 12 round, we'll be doing these podcasts every day. So check them out. Check out all of our other stuff. You can look back if you haven't already seen it. Our preview for the entire World Cup will be up and we'll get going. Jared, how are you doing today? Yeah, doing well today. It's uh, just, you know, just gone midnight here. Yeah. So tonight, but yeah, tonight. we're um, doing pretty well. Uh, we've had a, had some, had some, you know, a couple of boil overs so far, you know, early, early days. We've only had two days, four matches, but it's been some big results already, Jerry. Yeah, there's been a lot of exciting stuff so far, so I guess we should hop right into it. We'll start with what might be the biggest upset of the whole World Cup thus far, of course, but might even be the biggest upset overall. Namibia versus Sri Lanka. Namibia ended up winning by 55 runs, finishing 163 for seven to Sri Lanka's only 108. What were your thoughts on that match? Um, I was stunned. <laughs> um, yeah, it, I expected Sri Lanka, I mean, as we said in our preview pub, we expected Sri Lanka to come out of this group. But, um, you know, it was a shaky start for Namibia. Three wickets lost in the power play. And, you know, you're thinking, okay, that's probably about right. Uh, but they consolidated really well in the middle order than the Namibians. Um, Jan Frilink and JJ Smith put on a really, you know, so they, they basically rescued the innings. Fr- Frilink in particular through the middle order. Uh, JJ Smith, a bowler nominally, yeah, he put in a really nice display of power hitting late to uh, bring that run rate over eight and over to hit that 160 barrier that you you want to hit as a generally as a minimum in T20 cricket. So it set a solid target for the for the Sri Lankans to reach. Um, outside of of Frilly, he scored 44 off 28, hit four fours, um, and was pushing. To, he eventually went out when he was trying to push the pace. He was run out at the strikers end for a second run that was. Never ever on, uh, and Smith 31 off 16, two fours, two sixes. Um, but aside from that, there wasn't a whole lot to speak of. There are a few little contributions, but um, overall, yeah, 163, a good effort. I was very, very disappointed with the Sri Lankan bowling performance, though. You look at some of these names, like these are test match players, Chimera, um, Madashan, Karuna Ratna, they all went for more than nine and over, really disappointing. Run rate. Um, Dushmantha Chamira, I thought he was especially poor at the top of the innings. He, as much as there were wickets dropping, it wasn't him doing it. He wasn't able to stem the flow of runs. He was always the, the release valve for the Namibian batsman, where he should be the main strike bowler for Sri Lanka. Um, the spinner, uh, Hasaranga, he troubled the, the Namibians, but frankly, with the ball, he, he played a bit of a lone hand. Um, like, was there anything you saw in that Namibian innings, like outside of just I mean, that power and right. some pretty crappy balls? Yeah, start. It looked like Namibia was really in trouble starting out. Sri Lanka got two wickets in those first three overs, and like you said, when Smith and Freelink came off, Freelink came on. It was ninety three. They were ninety three for six before then, and it looked like Sri Lanka yeah. was just going to go and close it out. But those two really stepped up and kind of carried this Namibia team to a victory. But, yeah. And look, that said, I mean, 163, it's a solid target. And the, the, the wicket in Geelong at Cadenia Park, it was a little bit too paced. So 160, you know, it was probably worth about 180 on a regular pitch. But you would still expect Sri Lanka, a, a genuine test match playing nation, to take down a Namibian attack. Yeah. Um, now, it was a slow start. I, I think the Sri Lankan struggled with that too paced pitch. But there was a nice little partnership between uh, Rajapaska and uh, Shananka, the skipper, for 34 runs. Mm-hmm. Um, it had the team looking like they could they could run down that target. They'd need a little bit of luck, but, it, but you know, they looked relatively in control, the Sri Lankans. But from there, it was a disaster. They lost their last six wickets for just 34 runs. Like, just a... Like, that's a devastating collapse. Oh, yeah. And, and oh, yeah. Yeah, you look at Chinaka, 29 runs, a um, couple of fours and a six. Um, you know, he, he understood the situation, tried to get quick runs, tried to, to hoik Freelick over the leg side, but he, he picked out, like he just skied it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, I saw a lot Zane. of that. Yeah, of Zane, and, and that's a sign of a two-paced pitch as well. Like he just, 
you know, swung early at the ball and ended up skying it to, to Zane Green. Um, Roger Puska, yeah, you know, he was another one who tried to push the pace, but he was beaten in flight by uh, Bernard Schultz, the, the left arm spinner, and got caught at deep mid wicket. But um, man, like just a, there, there was nothing else there. Like there was, you know, those two have gotten basically, you know, close to fifty or close to fifty percent of the score for Sri Lanka. The other nine batsmen just did not show up at all. No, not at all. And I mean, oh, Ben Shikongo bowling for Namibia got two wickets and two consecutive balls. And that kind of yeah. seemed like almost a nail in the coffin at that time. It was just, there was just showing no life from Sri Lanka. And this guy came in and just shut him down immediately. And they were probably the second, or he was probably the third best bowler for Namibia yeah. on the day. Um, David Visa and, and Bernard Schultz were, were excellent, I thought. Um, you know, Visa had two for 16, Schultz two for 18. Importantly, when you're chasing a, or when you've set a, a relatively modest total, you need to get a lot of dot balls and T20 cricket, slow down that run rate, make the opposition have to take chances. They had 23 dot balls between them. That, the, the Sri Lankans were just not able to get those two away. And that created the pressure you know, for the other batsmen to hit the other bowlers out of the attack. And it just didn't happen. Yeah, it was honestly, I'm still surprised because as we both said in our preview, we felt like Sri Lanka was going to run away with this group and win all three matches. Now, mm. in this first one to Namibia, the pressure is back on Sri Lanka far more yeah. as they move forward in this. And who knows? Maybe we could see Sri Lanka going out. I still think they'll manage to get it done, but. Yeah, they, they have no margin for error, though. They, mm -hmm. they lose one more and they're, they're likely out of the tournament. I mean, as you said, lucky for them, though. It's the Netherlands and United Arab Emirates. They are the minnows of this group. Mm -hmm. On the flip side for Namibia, you know, this is their toughest game. They have set themselves up for potentially winning this group and going through to the Super 12s in, in the higher seating. So, you know, just a really, really good effort there. Frilink was um, man of the match. Um, but, yeah, he, this is one where... Yeah, Namibia have, have have kind of caught everyone on the hop for the first game here, a big upset. And uh, yeah, it's, it, it was a bit of a shame because the Sri Lankans came out in support of their team down in Geelong and you know, Sri Lankan fans, Indian fans, they create this really special atmosphere. But you just saw halfway through that innings, the crowd was just stunned. They had no idea how to deal with what they were seeing in front of them. No, it was quite a uh, remarkable yeah, performance and really yeah. just shut down that passionate Sri Lankan fan base that, like you said, looked lost out there. But if you have any more, do you have any more thoughts on this one or are you ready? No, to... I, I think we need to go to the second game of, yeah. uh, of day one, the other one down in Geelong, a real nail biter. Yeah, it really was. The Netherlands and the United Arab Emirates, the other two teams in that group A, and it came down to the second to last ball that the, the mm -hmm. Netherlands ended up winning 112 for seven, winning by three wickets to UAE's 111 for eight. And it was, a yeah, like you said, a real nail biter, really kept you watching until the very, very end to find out the result. And I'll admit, this wasn't the highest standard of cricket. No, <laughs> this was a, a bit of a scrappy game. It was two minnows of the tournament. And yeah, as we mentioned for, you know, a few minutes ago, that pitch down at Cadinia Park was, um, was tough for batsmen. It was very too paced. The bounce was um, a little bit all over the shop as well. It kept low quite a bit. And the UAE really struggled to come to grips with that. Um, but you know, to their credit, they dug in. It wasn't like they they just swung and swung and swung and, and just thought, oh, well, the pitch did me in. They almost took it like a mini test match and just kept, you know, made sure they kept the ball out, kept the scoreboard ticking over. And they had a little bit of big hitting laid on sprinkle in, yeah, you know, just to give them something to to let their bowlers bowl towards. I would assume that the um, the hope for UAE was you know dig in and accelerate late on, but the Dutch bowler Buster later he put pay to that with three wickets in the nineteenth over. None of them, no, no hat trick there, but still three wickets inside six balls, a pretty special effort late yeah. on in a game. Yeah. So you know, maybe UAE could have pulled off another 10 or 20 runs without uh, Delater's intervention. Yeah, especially when it ended up being only a one-run match mm. for the end. Those three yeah. wickets in that over could have been a completely different result. And we keep talking about how UAE came out and won their first match of the tournament. And it looked exactly. like... Exactly. And they got off to a strong... Oh, 
Go ahead. No, I was going to say, I, I just want to point out, um, you know, Mohamed Wasim, 40 run, 41 runs for UAE. He he was really good. A yeah, um, couple of big sixes. <laughs> yeah, he, he um, eventually got caught out trying to hook uh, Klaassen over mid-wicket, but um, I thought he was pretty good. Um, Aravind, Kashif Dowd, um, Chirag Searle, they all played nice little cameos, weren't able to build on, on good starts, but, you know, they there was a reasonable, you know, on a tough pitch, it was a reasonable effort from the UAE. Yeah, it was, especially yeah. considering that they were playing the youngest player in T20 cricket history mm. in yes. Ayan, Az- Ayan Afzal Khan. My mm. yeah. But yeah, 16 years, 335 days old. I mean, I remember when I was 16, I was learning to drive and <laughs> not playing on the crickets, one of cricket's biggest stages. And, he did. He did yeah. okay. Five runs. Playing off for your country balls. at sixteen, man. Yeah, it's um, something. It's else. almost sickening. It's almost yeah. sickening. So, That's <laughs> um, crazy, but yeah. But, and look, a little shout out here. You know, we mentioned that this pitch was hard to bat on, but Tim Pringle and Fred Clarkson at the top of the, the the opening bowlers for the Dutch were were really good as well. We mentioned Delater who picked up those three wickets in the nineteenth over, but um, yeah, Clarkson and Pringle they set up. The rest of the bowling attack by being really economical early on as well. Yeah, absolutely. It was kind of an all-around decent win. Nothing special for the Netherlands, but they did what they had to do to get this first win. And now yeah. they play, I believe, Namibia in the next game, which we were saying is going to be the decider for that second place position. But now it could be a decider yeah. for that first place position in the group. Yeah, and you know, I am. Um... Yeah, I, I, I've got to admit, the Dutch, you know, that there is a, I mean, we'll see what happens with Sri Lanka. I mean, you know, Sri Lanka might be, you know, nervous as hell coming into their next game, knowing it has to be a win. They have to play it perfectly. And you have a look at, like, like there's not a, a, a huge amount of batting in this Dutch lineup, but I was really taken by Max O'Dowd. Maybe it was the long hair, um, you know, his long, flowing blonde locks coming out the back of his helmet. But, at 23 off 18, um, he's not one to rotate the strike. 18 of his runs came from boundaries and sixes. But, um, yeah, power hitter. And on some of the smaller ovals, like Cadinia Park, like Bell Reeve, even like Adelaide Oval, which is really short square of the wicket, you know, if he can, if he can get going on some of those pitches, he, he could really make a name for himself for the, the beginnings or two, should the Dutch make it through the preliminaries. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah. Could. I mean, he led the Dutch in scoring in this match. And... He just showed the potential that is there that if he does get into his groove, he could start causing more problems for other teams bowling down the line. Yeah. Um, speaking of bowling, the UAE, I found it interesting that they, yeah, they really swung the bowlers around. Yeah, generally, you'll have five, maybe six at a, at a, at a stretch in a, in a T20 game. They pulled out seven bowlers for this one. And I think it was an effort to try and keep the Dutch off balance to not let them get used to the uneven pitch. It just about worked, as you mentioned at the top. They took this game to the second last ball. Uh, Sadiq was really good, three for 24 from his four overs, but I thought Zahul Khan, still try that again, Zahul Khan was the standout. He only picked up the one wicket, but only gave up 11 runs off 24 balls, 14 dot balls. He was almost unplayable. Um, on another day, on in those conditions, like if they played that T20 again in the same day, he might have picked up three or four. He was excellent. Yeah, he was. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see how the UAE faces off with Sri Lanka down the line. But mm. we'll move on to Group B. And there were another relatively interesting upset considering the standard that we're used to seeing the West Indies. You know, in our preview, we mentioned that they're not the same team they used to be. But mm. West Indies lost to Scotland by 42 runs. It wasn't exactly close in that one. And I George Muncy started out incredibly and played incredibly that entire match. Mm. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned that, you know, the standard we're used to the West Indies being, but also the standard we're used to Scotland being. Mm. You know, this is an, I think this is a bigger upset than the, Namib- the, than the Namibia match, mm. um, purely because you know, Namibia have, have at least made the, the, the last round of a major tournament. Scotland are genuine minnows. Yeah. Um, I they, <laughs> you mentioned I they made the Super 12 in the World Cup in 2021, but beside that, it was they've always been kind of that lesser team. 
Oh yeah, no, exactly. Scotland are yeah, they're you know the third best team in Britain. Yeah, <laughs> put it that way. Um, you mentioned Muncie, the the big lefty, sixteen runs from the second over of the game, um, and then in the third he hit three consecutive boundaries. He got the Scots off to a dead set flyer in this one. Um, it was a rain interrupted innings down in Hobart, and neither Muncie nor Scotland could quite find their groove once they uh, once play resumed. But you know they were able to to keep the scoreboard ticking over. Um, Muncie carried his bat. Yeah, you know, it's very very rare in any form of cricket, but even in T20 where you know, people tend to hit out and, and risk their wickets a lot for an opening batsman to finish the innings at, at, after 20 overs as well. So brilliant effort. From yeah. him, six to six yeah. runs overall, nine boundaries. Yeah, it was very um, impressive. And I mean, Scotland had the 12 runs in the 18th over and 15 in the mm -hmm. 20th over to kind of push that lead even more to reach that 160 mark that we were talking about earlier. Yeah. Yeah. And look, they had a really good opening stand. It wasn't just Muncie. Um, yeah, Michael Jones shared a 55 run opening stand. So at that point, you're thinking, gee, Scotland could go for 200 here. But the rain, it, it just took away Scotland's fur. It was a real shame because the Scots, the Scots were on one early. Yeah, so it's um, kind of that we look at, and it's just the team gets hot, their bats are on fire, and it ends up yeah. being very, very one-sided. Yeah, exactly. Um, Chris Greaves finished the innings well, some big hitting alongside Muncie. Callum McLeod, who might be the most Scottish-sounding person ever, um, he had a nice little cameo, 23 or 14. Um, for the Windies, with the bowling... Man, that was so disappointing. Muncie took a liking to Kyle Mayers right from the start. Mm. Um, and most of the other bowlers struggled. The only person who can really hold their head up is veteran, like the last holdover from the Great West Indies sides, the veteran Jason Holder. Only bowled the three overs, but two for 14, and was not just taking wickets, but economical. But aside from that, man, the Windies bowling. I know it's a new generation of West Indian cricket, but their bowling was, which is what they've hung their hat on for 40, 50 years. Yeah, the yeah. bowling was atrocious. In this. Holder was, aside, it was very, very subpar. But mm -hmm. you, men you mentioned Holder; he led the team in runs as well, with thirty-eight from thirty-three balls. And yeah, it, it was kind of just a bad batting performance all around from the Windies as well. Nicholas yeah. Turan out for only five runs. Not what mm -hmm. you need to see from your captain. No, exactly. I mean, you know. It was a reasonable start. I mean, Mayers had 20 from 14 before he went out. Uh, Evan Lewis scored at a decent clip. Brandon King, who came in for Mayers, yeah, he was going all right when until he was dismissed. But from there, it was a disaster. Like the, the Windies couldn't figure out the spinners. Mark Watt and Michael Leask picked up three and two wickets, respectively, and they were tough to get away. Three for 12, two for 15. They had the West Indies tied in knots. You mentioned Holder, 38 from 33. He was the only batsman to fire a shot in this one, outside of that little opening salvo from Mayers and Lewis. Um, it, like this was, like the bowling was bad, the batting was worse. You take Holder out of this side and, and like this might've been the worst World Cup performance I've ever seen. Yeah. This, yeah. Um, this new era of Caribbean cricket, it really couldn't have gotten off to a worse start. No, especially considering oh, they're hosting so the next T20 World Cup, which the mm. fans down there will want to see a at least competitive team, which when you're getting blown out by Scotland, it doesn't look like it's going to be a very competitive team, at least not this year. But, no, no. And look, you, you can only hope that the West that this was just a a collective bad day at the office for the West Indians. Um, yeah. they, they will have to beat Ireland and the Irish. You know, we'll get to their game in a moment, but the Irish will be looking for a bounce back game. Um, and they'll probably have to beat both Ireland and Zimbabwe to finish in the top two. So that's going to be tough based on what we saw from Zimbabwe today. Yeah, well, um, as for the Scots, if they can beat, you know, if they can win one more game, they will be in the Super 12s. Um, you know, they, they've, set them up, they've set themselves up beautifully. They, they've got a legitimate shot of making the Super 12s here, the Scots, which is something I just did not think would happen. No, I definitely thought Scotland would be probably second or third bottom in this group alongside yeah. Ireland. But when we've been to that Ireland and Zimbabwe match, mm. and like you said, Zimbabwe was on one that game. They were playing out of their mind for the most part. 
Yeah, mate, this was something else. You know, seven for 174, good innings, but it was an innings where it was all Sikanda Raza, uh, the oh. middle order batsman. He was wonderful. The the Irish actually looked on top early. Josh Little removed uh, Chakabza. Um, uh, he removed, uh, who else did he remove? Uh, Wes Madhaveri. Um, and he got them both with really nice balls, getting a lot of bounce out of the, the pitch, the big left armour. Um, they recovered well, though, and that was led by Raza. 82 from 48 balls, five fours, five sixes. Just like an awesome display of power, power here. He had a little bit of uh, support from Jongui late on, but it was really all Raza. Yeah, um, yeah it, it's, it's certainly the best innings of the opening two days of the tournament. And, and I reckon by the time this tournament is all wrapped up, it'll still be amongst the best four or five innings that we see in this tournament. It was, it was stunning, Bay. Yeah. And, and the thing is, he, he went out on the last ball of the innings as well. He was literally one ball away from getting red ink. Um, yeah, he, he was, yeah, he, he was just superb. No, Raza was clearly the man of the match for that game, and deservingly so. You said the 82 off 48 balls. Mm. And before then, Zimbabwe was looking at 39 for three, and things weren't looking mm. too good. But then he came in and really clutched up and put the team on his back to go out and get a big lead. Yeah, but he did. Um, the Irish uh, Josh, the well, from the Irish perspective, I thought Josh Little was really good. He, he picked up those two early wickets, but he picked up another one late, had three for 24. A lot of pace, a lot of aggression from him. Uh, got a lot of bounce out of the Bell Reef pitch too, which isn't traditionally all that bouncy of a wicket. Um, Mark Adair and Sammy Singh both picked up two wickets for Ireland, but they were pretty expensive. They were they fell victims to Raza and, and that big hitting of his. Um, yeah, we, we mentioned it was a... a a slow start for the Zimbabweans in their innings, and the Irish were, well, probably even even slower, quite frankly. Um, yeah, Richard McGovern, he picked up a pair of early wickets, one of them to just a ridiculous shot attempt from, from Lorcan Tucker. Uh, Tucker's a right-hand, for those who haven't seen it, Tucker's a right-hand batsman. Uh, McGovern is a left-arm bowler. He's bowling over the wicket. So, yeah, the ball is going to be coming across the right-hand batsman. <laughs> I was still not quite sure what Tucker was thinking, but he's he's walked all the way across over to his offside and just exposed all three wickets and tried to almost scoop the ball over fine leg. And he came nowhere near it, nowhere near it. The clean bowled and he wasn't within a foot of the ball. It was just an astonishingly stupid attempt. Yeah, I, I, I'm still laughing at that now. I literally laughed watching it. I was like, what was that? Like, I wouldn't try that, and I'm a god-awful cricketer. Um, at the other end of the, <laughs> the pitch, um, I, I love this kid's name, Blessing Muzarabani. He bowled with, like, pace and bounce and found the edge of the Irish bats. He picked up a pair of wickets of his own. Um, and at four for 22, the Irish innings was on its knees. Like, you know, this was expected to be a really good tight match. But, um, man, that opening salvo for, from the two young fast bowlers for Zimbabwe just shot this one down. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> Paul Sterling was bowled out on only his second ball of the match. Mm, and yeah. I mean, the same thing happened. That was, a, that was a ripping ball, too. Like, there was nothing wrong with the, the no, shot. As, as, yeah, that was just a – that was a peach. But like just getting your opener out that quick, we did see Zimbabwe get that, have that happen to them as well with Regis Chukaba, mm. where he went out on his second ball. But at the end of the day, the Irish just were not able to catch that 174 mark. No, no, there was a nice little mid innings fight back. Um, Curtis Camper and George Dockerell looked like they were you know, <laughs> launching a bit of a rescue mission. But um, that man Raza, you know, he came on and he bowls his all these little variations of medium to slow bowling. You'll bowl it with flick style. You'll bowl out of the back of the hand. You'll bowl off cutters, leg cutters. You'll spin it. He's, um, yeah, he, he, like he's, he's certainly not quick. He doesn't get a lot of bounce, but he's just so unpredictable with the ball. And the second ball of his first over cleaned up Dockerell with a gorgeous Yorker, just beat him hook, line and sinker. And that was kind of the death knell for the Irish. Camphor was still batting well. Gareth Delaney came in for, for uh, Dockerell and you know, hit the ball hard. But much like Dockerell, neither of those two could turn a good start into a big innings. Um, 
Barry McCarthy swung the swung the bat hard and picked up 22 runs late on, but the damage was done by them. The Irish were already out of the game. Yeah, absolutely. And now that lines us up for two exciting matches next for them: mm-hmm. West Indies and Zimbabwe, a bounce back match for the West Indies and Scotland, Ireland. But first, we'll touch on those other two in Group A, as it's the Netherlands and Namibia on Monday night, a midnight Eastern in the U.S before the UAE play Sri Lanka at 4 a.m. Eastern time on Tuesday morning. So what are your quick thoughts on those two matches? Yeah, look, I um, I was quite impressed with um, Namibia. I thought the Netherlands did well in the circumstance, but I'm looking at it as they didn't really have a lot of batting outside of O'Dowd, who is a power hitter. I think he's situational. I would expect Namibia... I was pretty impressed by them. I'd expect Namibia to win that one. Um, and Sri Lanka, I mean, my God, they have to have a bounce back match. UAE is one of the weakest teams in the tournament. And, you know, Sri Lanka really should be taking care of business. But, you know, we thought they'd take care of business against Namibia as well. So, yeah, um, yeah no, I, I would expect that Sri Lanka would have a bounce back. And, and I feel for UAE because I think they're going to get trounced in this one. It'll yeah, be an angry Sri yeah. Lanka team they play. I agree. I think Sri Lanka will come out trying to show that they're still one of these top dogs and are going to try and assert their dominance in this match. But yeah. the other two are uh, the following day, so Tuesday night and Wednesday morning in the U.S., Zimbabwe versus the West Indies and Ireland-Scotland. I these are two intriguing games, Jerry. Um, Scotland-Ireland, um, you know, as much as they're, I guess, united in their hatred of all things English, Given the English are a powerhouse in cricket, these two sides have almost become uh, become traditional rivals. You know, the, to be the next best team in the British Isles, um, mm. Scotland of you know Ireland generally consider themselves the better side, but of course they're coming off a really poor performance against Zimbabwe, and Scotland are coming off that you know big win, that surprise win against the West Indies. So. This will be one to see whether Scotland come in with a lot of confidence, whether Ireland can bounce back. I'm genuinely not sure which way this one's going to go. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll tip Ireland to bounce back, but I'm saying it with absolutely no confidence. Um, I was just very disappointed with the Irish bats in that in that game. And, you know, the score against Zimbabwe shouldn't have been as close as it was. Zimbabwe kind of let things slide a little bit late on them, sloppy in the field, dropped a few catches, their bowling wasn't quite as good. So this should have been a bigger loss for Ireland than what it says on the scoreboard. So I'm not I'm not all that confident in Ireland, but I'll, I'll just, I'll say that their quality should shine through. Okay. The Windies in Zimbabwe though, man, that is going to be a, an absolute hunting out. I'm really looking forward to that. The Windies... Like, like I said before, I, I'm putting it down to just a collective bad day at the office uh, in their loss to Scotland, but I would expect they will bounce back. And Zimbabwe, they were a lot better than what I thought they were coming into this tournament. I was very, very impressed with their bowl. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Zimbabwe looked like the best team we've seen in these first two days of the World Cup, mm. and the West Indies really, really need a bounce back match to, against them. and can't can't as you said earlier there's no margin for error they can't risk another loss because then they will probably be packing up and going home after oh they will be round so yeah two losses in the preliminaries jerry and you may as well walk over your third game and book a flight home you know it's um for sri lanka and the west indies two favorites to get out of their groups it is do or die it absolutely Uh, is so that'll conclude it for our first episode of this t20 world cup recap and match preview uh, hit us up on Twitter. You can reach Jared Prosser at, at hey underscore hey underscore it's underscore JP. You can reach me at, at Jerry F. It was 007. We want to hear your thoughts on the Cricket World Cup. Is there a team you are expecting to do well that hasn't? Are you surprised by what's happening? Let us know. You can check out all of our other stuff on the Vendetta Sports Media website, our Twitter page, our streaming platforms. And yeah, that's all it for me. Jared, any closing words? Um, a few really good games, a couple of upsets and um, some really quality performances from an individual level, both batting and bowling. And you know, from names that we don't necessarily hear a lot of in the cricket world, especially over here in Australia, 
you know, being Australia, we don't tend to look at Scotland and Namibia and the Netherlands. So it was really impressive to see some of these uh, more unknown players get their moment in the spotlight and, and make the most of it. On the flip side, I'm very, very interested to see how the West Indies and Sri Lanka bounce back from some pretty disappointing defeats in, in round one. Absolutely. So there it is, guys. Thanks for listening in. We'll see you next time.